We are still one short for a quorum. So I'm going to talk real slow in hopes that someone gets here in the next minute so we can stick to our, our, our regular agenda. But with that, uh, we've waited long enough. We do have a full agenda, so we want to get to uh, all of our testifiers. So we will postpone moving the bill and take to our first testifier. Oh, right. Okay. That's correct. Mr. Chair, so, you have a Mr. Chair House, House file, it's a DE amendment to House file 1935. And if we could have the uh, <laughs> staff walk through it and explain, explain it, we can then, well, ah, here we have. We're in business. So, See, I knew if I stumbled long enough, we, we have could a quorum. get going. All right. <laughs> So, first item of business is the minutes from April 4th. Representative Acom, have you had a chance to review the minutes? Yes, to, yes, Mr. Chair, I have, and I move approval. Okay, minutes have been moved. All in favor, say aye. 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 All in favor, or all opposed, say no. Minutes are approved. Next. Okay, uh, Chair Nelson, would you like to move House File 1935? I'll move House File 1935 to be referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Okay. And Chair Nelson, I see you have a DE1 amendment to House File 1935. And Mr. Chair, I'll move the DE1 amendment. And Mr. Chair, this is the this is the uh, um, state government finance will be, will be the state government finance bill for this year. This is a complimentation of uh, I, guess I, I think I said that right of all the bills that we've heard this year. The budget uh, recommendations from the governor and and uh, the funding levels for this committee. So, um, trying to meet our target that we were given by the Ways and Means Committee. Okay, and then I see you have the A1, the eight. I'm sorry, the A28 amendment to the DE1 amendment. And Mr. Chair, the A28 <coughs> amendment was um, before we get started. Basically, it just clarifies some things. Uh, one is that the film board uh, was is funded in the base, and so you'll. If you read through the bill, there's nothing talking about the film board because we felt um, we funded it at the base, um, even though we had some discussions about uh, of doing something differently earlier in committee. Um, this clarifies that the fun, the, for the first part of the amendment, though, uh, through page uh, 117 of the amendment, clarifies that the film board is fully funded at its base funding levels and that we're going to transfer that base to the deed. Um, in the next biennium. And there's been some talk with the uh, uh, chair of Ways and Means that when this bill got to Ways and Means that at some point when they started to put the bills together to match them up with the Senate, that they were going to do that anyway, but we're going to lay it out in the bill so people understand. Okay. The second piece, uh, 118 to 121, specifies that the, uh, just clarifies that the increase in the one the 1.5 million or 1.05 million of the Indian Affairs Council funding is for the Private Cemeteries Act. And members, that is what we, we had a bill earlier on that that talked about um, some changes, some tweaks in how that was going to be handled between the Historical Society, the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, and how they're going to deal with that. So, but that specifies that the, that the 1.05 million of that is for that purpose in the first year of the biennium. And then the second, the uh, 122 to 2.3, again, is similar language about the, well, this is language about the uh, um, moving expenses for the Arts Board. The Arts Board has a request in for 700,000 reallocation, relocation expenses. And this just kind of spells it out that how they can use that money and that if there are additional money left over, um, that it would revert back to the general fund. Okay. And then on uh, 2.5 <coughs> to 211, it's uh, healthy eating. Again, it's fully funded, but we're going to be that money is going to be transferred to the Department of Education, to their base in the outgoing, uh, outgoing years. Because again, those two programs that we talked about earlier were not, really aren't part of our budget, about what our budget's supposed to be about. Correction. Okay. And then the uh, last part of the bill, yeah. it helps clarify that. Well, the last part of the bill ex exempts, again, the IT projects from the 1% um, reduction we're asking for on um, IT, um, outside contracts for the Department of Administration. And then the last line of the bill 
It helps to clarify the appropriation <coughs> and private contributions for the capital flag program um, are not limited to the administration of the program, but it may also be used for the cost of the flag. Okay. And that's the, the D, or that's the A28 amendment. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair Nelson. Just one point of clarification. Uh, I believe you said uh, that um, the money was going from to the Department of Education, but it's actually going to the Department of Ag. Department, did I say education? Excuse me, I just misspoke. It's the Department of Ag. Correct? Okay, thank you very the much. The healthy program is is going to move that program to the to the Department of Ag, where it can. It probably fits best because it's dealing with farmers and farm healthy foods, and and it would it works it works inter, inter works with with the SNAP program, which they oversee. Very good. Okay, uh, discussion on the A28 amendment. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and Representative Nelson, thank you for the amendment in particular. Uh, a couple points. Um, I remember the conversation, but not the bill about the moving expenses, but that's, you know, for another day. Uh, but I did want to um, uh, appreciate and uh, thank you for concurring with our observations about the healthy eating program. Um, I think that's incredibly important to folks that rely upon it, and so uh, I'm going to take it upon uh, the conversation we had last week that you listened and uh, agreed with us on that, uh, and the uh, conversation about where to send it uh, into the Ag Department will be for another day, but uh, thank you for the amendment uh, on the Healthy Eating Program. Thank you, Chair Albright. Uh, Chair Nelson. And Mr. Chair and Representative Albright, it's never that I didn't think it was an important program, either that or the Film Board, it's just that those programs are funded out of our budget. They should have been funded out of those other budgets, should have been moved there probably when the budget process, when the budget came forward. But again, that's, they're both important programs. It's just that they weren't funded in the proper place. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, uh, Representative Albright. Thank you. And Representative Nelson, I, I think that you have uh, an overwhelming support in this committee, and I think you uh, might find that you have uh, what calls is uber support in the Senate where I understand that they've doubled the amount um, appropriated for that program in their program so thank you for that uh, representative Nash thank you mr. chair and um, chair Nelson thanks for adding that back in um, I know that it was a, leng a lengthy discussion and I, uh, I contributed to the length of it but um, really appreciate you putting this back in but was hoping that uh, before this gets to the floor or uh, we could talk about where it's going in yours as the uh, Department of Ag. If you could get maybe a, a, an estimate as to what the administration of that will be, because one of the conversations that we had was what what amount will they be utilizing from the money that's granted to them to administer the cost of the program? And I know that's not a question for now, but maybe to put it on the list of things to talk about for later, because ultimately we want the money as much money as we can to get to the people who are using it as opposed to having uh, a larger percentage than uh, it's currently being uh, taken out of humanities to be uh, taken out for the administration over in ag so if you could maybe uh, get an estimate from fiscal staff or somebody uh, that would be greatly appreciated because again I, I know you all like the program but I think we want to put it in the place that's going to be the most cost effective uh, for administration and I, I look at this a lot like I look at charities that my wife and I choose to donate to. We look for charities that are utilizing a smaller percentage of the money that we give them to administer getting that money out into the people that it's going to help. I look at it the very same way with this, that if we can uh, squeeze the dollar of administration out of that, then that's a good thing. Chair Nelson. Mr. Chair, Representative Nash, as the only thing this bill, is, only thing the language that this bill is doing is moving the base funding it from our committee to the ag committee and it's not changing who the fiscal agent is so if this just goes over there the fiscal agent will stay the same which is the humanities center and so nothing in that part of it would change it's just that the, the money would is in the base budget for ag as opposed to the base budget for state government finance okay uh representative keel uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Chair Nelson, I apologize. I walked in a little bit late, but I'm catching the. My concern is how would the funding come out of ag if we've already finished our bill and we haven't heard it? Chair Nelson. Mr. Chair, it's, it's to, like I said, it's the money. What we're doing is, is basically moving the base, the base from our base to their base, and that's 
what we're going to be doing in the, as I said earlier with, the, with, this, with this, is that the Ways and Means Committee chair was talked about d doing this adjustment in the Ways and Means Committee when they let match up our budget bills with the Senate budget bills. The Senate has it funded there, has it funded elsewhere. So this, that's basically part of the, the consolidation <coughs> program or process that the Ways and Means does. We're just putting it in here, similar to what the, what the Senate put in their bill. They did the similar thing with moving the money, at least for the film board, to, the, to deed. And we're doing the same thing here. So that's what it is. We're just, in future years, we're going to put it in the base of those committees. Currently, it's in our base, and it stayed in our base. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further discussion on the A28 amendment. Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Albright. So just a point of clarification for the author of the amendment. So my understanding is that the, the base funding is restored for the current biennium, but you're moving it someplace else in the next biennium beginning in 22. Correct. And Mr. Chair, then as a point of clarification for um, House uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Smart Guy. Um, <laughs> Which one? Mr. Gearing, um, the smartest one in the room. Yeah, there you go. Um, so I think there's still some ambiguity, and maybe you can bring the clarity we're all looking for. But on lines 2.9 through 2.11, it talks about in 22 that. It's, the amount is added to the base in the Department of Agriculture. And I heard the author of the amendment suggest that that does not change uh, the fiscal agent from the humanities. And, and I just want to make sure which way is this to be interpreted with that um, uh, response from the author of the amendment. Mr. Gearing, you want to respond? Or <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Albright, so the, um, the statutory authority for the grant program um, isn't being amended in this bill, so it's still the Minnesota, the Minnesota Humanities Center that would be required to administer the grants. Okay. So I think effectively what would happen is that the Department of Ag would uh, be a fiscal agent for the Humanities Center to get them the money to administer the grants, but Ms. Roberts might have something to add to that. Ms. Roberts? Um, Mr. Chair, members, I think that's correct. The, what would happen is in the next, um, and, and the end of stage, end of session fund statements, this amount would get moved into the Department of Agriculture, but as Mr. Grain said, the underlying statute is not changed. Okay. Any further discussion on the A28 <coughs> amendment? <coughs> Seeing none, and then we're going to vote on moving uh, the A28 to the DE1 amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The amendment passes. Okay, moving on. This is where we get to. Um, and Mr. Chair, I'd just like to do a, yes, Chair brief, Nelson. a brief overview. Um, again, this the DE1 amendment is going to be the uh, state government finance bill going forward, the uh, House File 1935. Um, the things in this bill are, th are, there's nothing in this bill with one minor exception that w was not heard in this committee. And that minor exception has to do with, there's a piece in here about the gain sharing program. And we discussed that in committee earlier when the Department of Admin was here about the, coming back to us with language about how they could tweak this so that they could administer it and make the program work. And that's, I guess, so that would be the only thing that's in here that we didn't hear in a, in a bill form in committee. And uh, they did say they were going to come back. They came back late with that. And that's um, the only language in here that we didn't hear in a bill form in this committee that, I, that I'm aware of. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we have uh, Ms. Roberts and Mr. Gearing to walk us through the bill. And members, uh, if you have a clarifying question, uh, please raise your hand, but please limit it to uh, clarifying questions for staff, please. Uh, who's going first? <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chair, I'm going to walk through the spreadsheet first. Right. And I wanted to point out to members, you actually have two different spreadsheets in your packet. Um, one of them is entitled 2019 Session, House State Government Finance Division General Fund Summary. Um, this is the 20-page spreadsheet. It's the very detailed tracking. The first few pages are um, general fund summaries only, but the following pages are, are the detail for each agency. And unless there's any objection, I'm not going to walk through this one. But you can use it as a reference. It'll show you some change columns to show you the change from base and percentage from base. Um, but instead, I'm going to use what the second um, spreadsheet, which is entitled Change Items. And this will show you the changes 
from the base um, <coughs> to for each of the agencies. And again, I, if you have any questions on the detailed spreadsheet, I can I certainly can answer those. Um, so starting with the, the shorter change item spreadsheet, um, you're going to want to look at the column that's entitled House File 1935 DE1 Amendment. <coughs> and so the first change is the um, on line six is the operating increase for the house, and that's $11.5 million. Um, next is the operating increase for the LCC, the Legislative Coordinating Commission, and that is $4.8 million for the biennium. After that, you'll see a reduction to the LCC base of $1.6 million. That's from the repeal of the Legislative Budget Office. Um, a, Following that, $317,000 for the biennium for restoring the office on the economic status of women. Uh, there is $218,000 included for the Legislative redistrict, Redistricting Commission that's established in the bill. Um, $1.179 million is included for the Legislature's <laughs> Accessibility Work Group that's established in the bill. And then finally, you'll see $265,000 for the Data Practices Commission, the extension of that commission. So the total um, increase over the base for the legislature is $16.6 .6 million for the biennium. The next item is for the um, governor's office. You'll see um, $700,000 for the biennium for the Office of Public Engagement. Under the state auditor, um, this bill includes the governor's recommended funding increase of 1.458 million, and you'll see the four different items listed, the operating adjustment, township specialist, refilling the staff supports uh, positions, and refilling the deputy state auditor position. Moving on to the attorney general, um, two of the change item, two change items are um, funded. Uh, 1.9 million for maintaining and stabilizing experienced attorney staff, and then 2.3 million for enhanced criminal enforcement, both assistance to rural counties and prosecution of econo economic crimes. So that's a total increase of 4.25 million over the biennium. On the line uh, right underneath that, you'll see there's some additional funding provided out of the state government special revenue fund, for, again, to maintain and stabilize the attorney's staff. Um, under the Secretary of State, beginning on line 31, um, you'll see there's a fiscal year 19 column, and that includes the $1.3 million in um, litigation fees that were discussed when the office was before us. Um, we do need to count that against our target. Um, then you'll see the $905,000 operating adjustment, the $163,000 one-time funds for the HABA state match, um, an increase of $457,000 for the Safe at Home program, and then $103,000 included for the omnibus elections bill administrative costs. Um, so that's a total general fund increase for the Secretary of State of $1.6 million for the biennium. And then the line un underneath that is for a provision included in the omnibus um, elections bill for reimbursing local governments for special election costs. This creates a new open statutory appropriation, so we are tracking $262,000 for that item. Moving on to the second page, um, the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. There's a total of increase of 200,000 for the biennium, um, 150 for the operating adjustment, and $50,000 one-time funding for the web-based campaign finance reporter. <coughs> the online 47, you'll see um, $18,000 per year for administrative hearings. This is for salary, salary parity for some of the judges, and this is a non-general fund item. It comes out of the workers' compensation fund. On line 51, under minute services, there's two um, provisions that are funded above the base, 4.1 million for the IT portfolio and project management oversight, and then $20 million for securing the state. That's a cybersecurity initiative. That's a total of 24.1 million for minute services. And then you'll see, um, noted on the spreadsheet, but without any dollars, um, the minute cash flow assistance, which has um, is now $50 million. In the past, they had requested $110 million, I believe, for that. So it has um, decreased. Um, beginning on line 58 for Department of Administration, the first <clears throat> increase is a $500,000 increase beginning in fiscal year 21 for the in lieu of rent increase. And that um, is for the rent, the space in the state office building, 
ceremonial space in the Capitol. Um, on line 60, there's a $882,000 increase for the pro Procurement Technical Assistance Center match. On line 61, a $132,000 operating adjustment for the department. On line 62, $1.6 million in one-time funding is included for the 2020 Census Mobilization and Outreach. Um, on line 63, you'll see a negative 374,000. That's for the transfer of the Office of School Trust Fund lands to the DNR. The environment building, the environment bill will have a matching increase. Um, on line 64, there's um, just a short explanation. There was a revised governor's rec related to the Ford office building to redir redirect base funding from the state demographer in, in the tails only after their census work is done to provide funding for the Ford building, which is now empty and uh, needs repairs and doesn't have a source of funding for that. So I'm sorry, it's not showing up because it would only have been in the governor's tails. You could see that on the detailed spreadsheet. On line 65, there's a $400,000 increase for Minnesota Public Radio for their Amber Alert system upgrades. On line 66, 1.6 million for Beyond op op Opioids, the public TV and radio program. Um, on line 67, $200,000 increase for the Biennium for the Amherst Community Service Grants. And then on the line below that, $50,000 for the Amper's Equipment Grant. Those are all increases over the base. Um, on line 69, you'll see $75,000 in one-time funding for the Amper's Veterans Voices programming related to the Korean War. Um, next, uh, $200,000 in total for the local government website improvement grants. And then finally, $30,000 Beginning in fiscal year 21, this is one time funding for um, the flags for soldiers and first responders that are killed in the line of duty. So the total change, general fund change for the Department of Administration is 5.295 million for the biennium. At the bottom of the page, you'll see um, MMB with several change items. The first is 2.036 million for the state workforce investment, um, $5.5 million in one time fund for their enterprise systems upgrades, uh, 929,000 for the biennium for an operating adjustment, and then 457,000 for um, the enhanced results analysis for decision making. So that's a total of 8.9 million in um, general fund increases for the Minnesota management and budget. The line underneath that is um, a reduction within the special revenue fund. Currently the um, statewide executive recru recruiter is uh, funded through um, agreements with agencies where agencies are paying for this. And uh, the proposal is to now fund that directly through the general fund. Moving on to page three, and I'm sorry the page break didn't line up too well there, but this is for the Department of Revenue, and you'll see that they have a $10.871 million increase for the biennium for their operating adjustment. Moving down to the Amateur Sports Commission, on line 87, there's a one-time operating adjustment of $35,000. Um, $1 million is included for the Mighty Ducks grant program, one-time funding, and then $200, um, $250,000 in one-time funding for Mighty Ducks reimbursement grants. And then finally, $75,000 in one-time funding for the velodrome planning money. So that's a total of $1.36 million for the biennium. Uh, moving down into the various councils, the first one is the Minnesota of African Heritage Council, so their total increase is 549,000. Um, for the Latino Affairs Council, um, there's a $54,000 operating adjustment, and then $320,000 for the communications specialist and office assistant. For, so for that council, it's a total of 374,000 increase. For the Asian Pacific Council, Again, two items, $95,000 for an operating adjustment and $200,000 for a communication specialist for a total increase of $295,000. And then um, for the Indian Affairs Council, there's an increase of uh, a bit over a million dollars for the Private Cemetery Act amendments and there's language included in the bill related to this. Uh, moving on to the Minnesota Historical Society, um, the operating adjustment is 1.45 million uh, for 
digital preservation, uh, 790,000 for the biennium, and then 400,000 one-time funding for the military museum at Camp Ripley. So the increase for the Minnesota Historical Society is 2.64 million over the bi for the biennium. And for the Minnesota Arts Board, on line 118, there's $700,000 in one-time funding for their office relocation. Um, moving on to the accountancy board, uh, three items here, there's uh, $67,000, this is on line 122, for their operating adjustment, $50,000 for and one-time money for an online permitting system, and then an $8,000 a year reduction that's related to the, C the modifications in the CP a licensing um, provision. So that's a total, net total of 101,000 for the biennium. For the architectural engineering board, um, similar, you'll see a $94,000 operating adjustment and $50,000 in one-time funding for their permitting system for a total of 144,000. Um, for the cosmetology board on line 133, an operating adjustment of 253,000 and then $12,000 in one-time funding for the um, programming costs related to the hair braiders exemption from licensing. On line 138, there's a $10 million a year increase for the Minneapolis Employers Retirement State Aid, or MRF. And then at the bottom of the spreadsheet, you'll see the um, total, or in the, not quite at the bottom, but you'll see the total expenditure changes of um, <coughs> $101.5 million uh, direct general fund changes, and then a uh, $262,000 change in the statutory appropriation. Um, at the bottom of the spreadsheet, you see we have to track the revenues. In this case, there are a loss of revenue to the general fund. And so for the total reconciliation for this bill, the um, bill um, with all of the uh, expenditure changes, including the fiscal year 19 changes that we are counting and the revenue loss, the net general fund spending is 987 $987,386,000. This is $102.5 million above the base and um, $13 million above the governor's recommendations. All right. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. I uh, really appreciate uh, the detail on uh, walking us through. Um, Mr. Gearing, uh, you're next up. Uh, Mr. Chair, then um, following Ms. Roberts, what I'm going to do is walk through the policy items that are in the bill and just to orient you to what I'm going to be looking at. Um, uh, I'm going to be working off the DE1 amendment um, starting on page 16, which is Article 2. Um, so all of the, uh, the spending items that Ms. Roberts walked through in the spreadsheet are included in Article 1 of the DE1 amendment. Um, and because she's already covered those things, I'm not going to discuss those um, right now. Uh, there's also in your packet um, a separate um, sort of spreadsheet style policy summary that's um, labeled 2019 House State Government Finance Omnibus Delete Everything Amendment, and that gives you uh, a, a way to track um, which bills are included in the DE1. <coughs> so starting with Article 2 on page 16, uh, Section 1 of Article 2 uh, comes from Representative Nelson's um, Accessibility at the Legislature um, bill. Uh, this is the language that requires the legislature to comply with the uh, minute accessibility standards um, as of September 1 of 2021. Uh, section 2 on page 17 has represented Lesh's bill that extends the uh, Commission on Data Practices and Personal Data Privacy to 2026. Section 3 on page 17 is Representative Fisher's bill that extends the Legislative Water Commission to July 1st, 2025. Section 4 uh, is Representative Nelson's bill that provides for the um, sal salary parity for Office of Administrative Hearing judges. Uh, section 5 on page 17 comes from Representative Lilly's bill. This is the language that provides um, uh, for back pay for uh, state employees in the event of a state shutdown. Um, this language has been restructured somewhat for clarity purposes uh, and uh, uh, provides that the um, back pay will be provided only upon the employee's return to work. Section 6 on page 18 is the gain sharing modifications that uh, Chair Nelson mentioned uh, were included in this bill. On page 20 is Representative Huat's, uh, the first section of Representative Huat's uh, capital flag program bill. Uh, this is largely the way that it was in front of the committee last week, um, but this has a delayed effective date until July 1st of 2020, and then there's a study that I'll point out um, a little bit later uh, in the language. Sections 8 and 9, uh, starting on page 21, is Representative Purcell's bill related to the use of uh, renewable and solar energy on state-owned um, state building projects. 
Section 10 on page 22 is Representative Cantrell's bill. This is the language that establishes the Office of Enterprise Sustainability within the Department of Administration as a statutory office as opposed to by executive order. On page 23, section 11 is Representative Elkin's uh, policy language that goes along with the accessibility grant funding that Ms. Roberts already mentioned. Uh, this language would provide for a, an advisory council to assist the Commissioner of Administration uh, in deciding how those grants would be awarded. On page 24, section 12 is Representative Pearson's bill that relates to the use of uh, conflict-free minerals in state contracting. On page 25, section 13 uh, is Representative Freiburg's language related to um, the availability of um, design and construction contracts uh, in the event of an emergency. Uh, section 14 uh, is Representative Moran's bill. This is the language that allows uh, the commissioner to, to recognize other certifying organizations in order to certify a, a business as um, um, qualifying for certain uh, minority and other uh, targeted group business operations. On page 26, section 15, as Representative Nelson's language related to um, competitive bidding uh, in the best and, uh, best and final offer language. Uh, section 16 is also Representative Nelson's bill. This is uh, another section that goes with the legislative accessibility language. This requires the um, chief administrator, the chief information officer a minute to provide assistance to the legislature uh, in complying with accessibility standards. Uh, section 17 on page 27 is the first section that relates to hair braiding. This is Represent Moran's bill that eliminates the requirement that hair braiders <laughs> provide uh, registration to the Board of Cosmetology. Uh, section 18 also relates to that bill. And then sections 19 through 34 um, all relate to the Racing Commission. Uh, this includes two separate bills. One is the um, uh, described as the administrative bill from the commission uh, and uh, includes a number of technical changes that the committee saw. Section 28 um, was a separate bill of Representative Tabkeys that provides a statutory appropriation to the Racing Commission uh, for proceeds that are contained in their um, uh, racing and card playing regulation account. And Mr. Chair, then that runs us all the way through to page 40. Uh, section 35 on page 40 ex uh, increases the cap on the amount of an award under the Mighty Ducks um, ice grant uh, program. This is language that was included in Representative Cagle's bill. It was also include, cl included in Representative Lilly's bill and Representative Jurgens's bill uh, when it was in front of this committee. Uh, section 36 on page 42 is a long section that deals with the uh, Indian Affairs Council and the Department of Administration. This is language that modifies the way that um, cemeteries and burial grounds um, are identified and protected under law. Then on page 48, um, starting with section 37, and this runs through section <coughs> 44, is Representative Huat's bill that provides a number of technical and administrative modifications related to the um, practice of certified uh, public accounting. Uh, and then on page 59, section 45, uh, then also on page 60, section 46 are the two uh, statutory changes that implement the uh, increased state obligation to contribute to the Minneapolis Employees Retirement Fund or the MRF uh, account. Uh, section 47 on the bottom of page 60 is language that requires um, uh, uh, housing facilities to allow access to uh, census workers um, during the census next year. Uh, this is in Representative Long's bill. Uh, also in, um, from Representative Long's bill is section 48 at the bottom of page 61. This is the uh, census uh, mobilization project. Um, the language here is um, pretty close to what was in front of the committee before, except that the uh, sub-grant and granting process has been amended um, uh, to clarify the uh, organizations that would receive uh, grants. Section 49 on page 63 is um, the Legislative Employee Working Group on Accessibility Measures. Uh, this also comes from Representative Nelson's bill. Uh, section 50 at the bottom of page 64 is the substantive language that repeals the Legislative Budget Office. This was Representative Nelson's bill also. On page 51 section, or excuse me, on page 65, section 51 uh, is language from Representative Bierman's bill that replaces the World War I plaque on the Capitol Mall. Section 52 on page 65 is the corresponding language that goes with the capital flag program. This is language that requires the Commissioner of Administration uh, to study and report back on um, uh, ways to address expected challenges in implementing the flag program. 
On page 66, section 53 are repealers. There are two subdivisions of repealers. One relates to hair braiding, uh, and then the other place, uh, relates to the legislative budget office. Then Article 3 um, starts on page 66 and runs through page 86 of the bill. Uh, this is the language that provides a number of technical and uh, conforming changes to replace the word uh, warrant with payment in a variety of uh, chapters of statute. Um, this is largely in, this, in the same form that the committee saw before, except that it's been uh, condensed somewhat to provide a revised instruction to make some changes rather than making all the changes directly in this bill. And then, Mr. Chair, um, Articles 4, 5, and 6, I'm not going to um, walk through uh, section by section unless you'd like me to do that. Um, 4, 5, and 6 are the um, articles from the elections uh, bill that Representative Dean presented last week. Uh, in his um, testimony and discussion, he did a good job of walking through uh, the different provisions that were in the bill, so I won't do that right now, uh, except just to highlight one change, which is that um, there's language in here related to the um, presidential nomination primary. Um, that uh, language has been modified somewhat to clarify uh, the ballot format that would be used in the primary and also to exclude certain types of parties from being involved in that process. Thank you, Mr. Gearing. Uh, appreciate the thorough walkthrough. Um, members, any clarifying questions for staff? Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Representative Albright. Mr. Chair, um, for the author of the bill, um, pardon me as I look back, but I know that um, Section 11. Page? Uh, page 23, thank you. And I, and, and Chair Nelson, I looked forward at our schedule, or at the schedule for various uh, committees, and, and I note that we have not heard this in our committee, but I understand it is scheduled to be heard on Wednesday in local government. Is that correct? Chair Nelson? Are we talking 23 of the bill or? I'm looking at page 23 of the DE. Yeah, so Representative um, Albright, uh, we heard the bill, but it was amended afterwards. So uh, could you verify when we heard that? Yes, uh, it, it, as was uh, Mentioned earlier, this is a Representative Elkins' bill, and I know it's uh, it is scheduled for Wednesday before uh, Chair Freiberg's committee. Local government Wednesday, Sandy Mason. Chair Mason. Uh, I'm sorry. GovOps on Thursday. GovOps on Thursday. Yes, Chair. Yes, Representative Elkins. Yeah, I can read. So we heard the uh, the bill in its original form very early on. Um, but at the time, uh, it wasn't fully fleshed out. There was no governing body, which is um, uh, and and which is going to be composed of local government officials. Which is why now that we have the the, the bill fully fleshed out and it includes a steering committee composed of local government officials, we thought it was appropriate to also put it through um, both local government and gov ops. Okay. Thank you, Representative Elkins. Uh, Representative Albright, follow up. Yeah, M Mr. Chair, and I just, you know, just from a, a process perspective, I think, you know, one of the things that I find cumbersome is that, you know, we've heard that bill, uh, but not the entirety of the bill, particularly with uh, regard to subdivision two, but yet we're including in the omnibus bill, but then we're also taking it on faith that it comes out of local government without any amendments or without any changes. So I think it's a bit cumbersome <coughs> that we're assuming that it is as it is here but yet you're hearing it in another <laughs> committee, but we're going to take it on faith in the DE here that there's no changes. So, Representative Elkins, can you see my confliction? Um, Representative Elkins. Yes, Representative I, I, Albright, I definitely can. I can assure you that the, 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 the form of the steering committee has been agreed upon by all of the, the stakeholder groups that are involved, uh, will be involved in administering this. So I have peace in the valley among the stakeholders on those provisions. Representative Elkins, Mr. Chair, Representative, while I appreciate your sincerity, um, and I'm I'm not I'm not trying to turn into a cynic, you know, a cynical old fourth termer, um, but I've heard "peace in the valley" more times, and if I had a nickel for every time I heard that, <laughs> I would I would not not have to work any longer. Um, Mr. Chair, I have another 
follow-up question. Yes, Representative Albright. Thank you. Um, this would regard to the uh, the private cemeteries language. Page. And on page 42. And, and I, I, my memory, it may be failing me, uh, Chair Nelson, but did we hear the, the full content of this language in committee? And maybe that was the one that you were referring to that we did not hear here. And we've got a disgruntled look on the chair's face, so. Mr. Chair, I, I too have my memory. We've heard a lot of bills, and I, I believe, yes, we did hear this. And I guess Mr. Geldman is whispering at me. Maybe he can answer the question better. He's whispering, trying to whisper at me, but I, my hearing's not that good. <laughs> Mr. Geldman, uh, could you refresh the, uh, the committee, please? Mr. Chair, Representative Albright, when the Indian Affairs Council was in front of the uh, committee talking about its overview, they talked about the need for this language, hmm. and uh, they brought this forward. And Mr. And Mr. Chair, Chair Nelson, Representative Albright, and I may have overspoke when I said everything we've heard in this bill. We've heard from some of the stuff that's in this bill, the stuff that's been brought forward, recommendations from the governor's office and from the governor's staff, from admin to MMB, is that they're, sure. what they discussed in there when they did their presentations, and this probably would fall into that, um, into that basket. Okay. Thank you, Chair Nelson. So uh, just from a process, Mr. Right. Chair, thank you mm -hmm. for a process perspective, and maybe either the Chair uh, Nelson or Mr. Gelbman can refresh my memory, but is there a house file number associated with this language? Uh, Mr. Gelbman, I guess. I don't believe there's a house file. Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Albright, it is included in, I'm not sure of the house file number, but it was the governor's bill that was introduced by Chair Nelson. 2087. 2087. 2087. Um, Representative Albright. Thank you. Um, and Chair Nelson, and just maybe more a point of clarification, when I'm looking on page 42 and line 42.20, definitionally speaking, uh, we've removed authenticated human burial ground and we've included then or uh, added assessed cemetery. So do we have a definition for what assessed cemetery is? Mr. Chair, uh, I think I would ask uh, Mr. Gehring if what that language means. Mr. Gehring. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Chair, Representative Albright, um, on page 43, uh, sorry, on line 12, 43.12 to the end of that page, is language that provides the process for assessing cemeteries by the state archaeologist. Mm. Um, so I think I would um, appoint you to that, and then I might defer to the state archaeologist to answer other questions about that. Okay. And I'm not going to belabor the point, but my understanding would be that an assessed cemetery uh, would be one that would not be denoted by a tombstone or monument, but yet identified as in the case of a burial mound. And so any desecration, vandalism of that space would be to an assessed cemetery rather than one that's denoted by a uh, a, a, a memorialized tombstone or something like that. So it would pertain just to areas or, or geographic demography. So Representative Albright, and kind of reading through the language here, uh, perhaps a question for the state archeologist if he or she is present, seeing not. Um, I, th I think rather than, you know, to hold up the, the process, I'm going to take that one offline, Chair. Fair and enough. And Mr. Chair, I... What's yeah. going on with that one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, Chair Nelson. And Mr. Chair, members, I, I will we'll look into that because I, 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 I believe that they're trying, they're trying to do is get, a, get a, a record and have a record of the cemeteries, but sometimes these show up without... At the, in future that they didn't know were cemeteries that aren't marked. Um, other ones, like you said, are mo burial mounds. And this is getting at how they're going to handle this. And so, but we, that's a good question. I will mark it down as a question I need to get my answer to. Okay. Thank you, Chair Nelson. Any other clarifying questions? Just one more, Mr. Chair. Yes, Representative Albright. On, uh, for Chair Nelson on page 18, 
uh, subdivision, or excuse me, section six, uh, with regard to the employee gain sharing system. Um, when did the committee hear that section? And Mr. Chair, members, as I, as I did in my introduction, the gain sharing piece, like I said, we talked with admin, it's very early in committee about issues that people have had with that, the fact that there, there's been some complaints that they weren't following the law and implementing, implementing this program. The department administration said that they had issues with how, with the way the law was written in the language and current statute, and it made it difficult for them to actually do this program. So we asked them to bring back language. We did it in committee. We asked them to bring back language to us as to um, how they could tweak this to make it work so they could, it was a workable for them. And they brought this language back to us. And as I said in my introduction, this is one piece that we, 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 they said they were going to bring the language back. They brought the language back, and so we put it in the bill. So other than, like I said, that's the one piece that I pointed out that we did not hear as a bill, but we heard the concept of it in committee. We've um, asked them to make, to write, make sure this program works. So we brought, asked them to bring back language to make the program work. And so this is what this language is. Okay. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Representative Albright. And, and respectfully submitted, uh, Chair Nelson, um, it is about the process. There is no house file. And while I appreciate the sentiments of, of the department <laughs> to bring this forward, I, I, I certainly hope it isn't the intent of this legislature to move uh, omnibus bills that include concepts rather than house files. I think that's a slippery slope. And from what you just said, we're including a concept to make it work for a department when we are the ones that are determining what works for uh, us and they are to, you know, do our bidding. I certainly appreciate the fact that if something is not tenable for them that they would bring observations back to us. But um, this, this idea of including concepts rather than hard fact uh, and, and house files in a bill is, is at the very least uh, very problematic for this side of the chair, this side of the table. Uh, noted. Uh, Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to fiscal staff, uh, Ms. Roberts, if you could walk me through on page 87, lines 87.17 through 87.20. Uh, it is the elections bill component of the, the bill while you're turning there, and it's a uh, provision that provides uh, transit service free of charge on elections day. And, and maybe I missed it, I could have, but is there an appropriation for that? Is there a fiscal note for that? Um, and if, if neither of those is the case, how would that be paid? Ms. Roberts. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Nash, there is not an appropriation for that provision included in this bill. It's my understanding that the, in the separate bill dealing with this was heard by the Transportation Committee. Um, so it, if they chose to fund it, it would be funded in that committee. Uh, Representative Nash. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and perhaps to Chair Nelson. So the the policy provision is in our finance bill, but the finances is in transportation. And since I don't serve on that committee, um, I'm just wondering what level of funding does that provide for people in the outstate, or is that just Metro as it was before? Um, and then what's going to happen to this piece of policy if that funding provision doesn't make it through? And maybe that's a question for Mr. Gehring. But I'm, I'm just kind of confused as to how all that happens. And I'm, I'm unaccustomed to having an elections bill in the state government finance division. So I'm, I'm full of questions. Uh, some would say I'm full of something. But you know, um, just wondering if you could maybe uh, help, help us understand that. And Mr. Chair and Representative Nash, uh, that, that, that accusation the level against me also many times in the past. But if you read the language of the, that's in 87.17 to 87.20, it's not just Metro only. It's wherever there is fixed route public service. So this would include Duluth. This would include St. Cloud. They're not Metro. This would include any place in the state where they have a fixed route scheduled service that on election day they would be required to provide people who are going to the polls free bus service. That's what the bill, and it, and it was in the election bill coming forward, and that's the language was in the election bill. 
and I and it was discussed in transportation, which I do serve on. Um, not sure what, if it's being funded or not, or whether they're asking to absorb the cost. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative um, Nash, if you want to finish up this line of questioning, but then I, I really do want to get uh, to our testifiers. Uh, we have some constitutional officers as well as sure. folks um, that have traveled, but we can yeah, wrap Chair, up this line of questioning. And this is this is an important issue. That Understood. There's no funding for it, and I'm wondering: is there a local impact note? Um, can someone let me know that? Anybody who would like to answer that question? Uh, Ms. Roberts? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Nash, I'm not aware of a local impact note being requested. As you probably know, it's a different process than requesting a okay. fiscal note and uh, requires communication from the yep. tax committee. And Mr. Chair, I'll, I will yep. wrap up here. Um, but my question, I think, is an appropriate one. We've been asked to provide policy enabling language that's predicated <coughs> on funding in a different committee that that provision may or may not make it all the way through. So my question for Mr. Gehring uh, is if that scenario were to happen and funding for this is not enabled in the transportation bill, what happens to this policy language? Because from where I sit, that could actually create an unfunded mandate for somebody. And I'm just trying to figure that out. Mr. Gehring. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative uh, Nash, so if the statute goes into place and there's not an appropriation provided, then the affected um, groups would have to absorb the costs in their existing budgets. Could you repeat that, Mr. Gehring? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, Representative Nash, um, the, the um, programs that receive uh, operating assistance and are subject to this mandate would be required to absorb the costs in their existing budgets. Representative Nash? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, We'll talk about this come tomorrow, but I, I think that that's an interesting provision that, you know, we've talked through the funding of all these things, but we've got no actually securable funding for something that's in this particular bill. Um, and from my perspective, that I understand that it covers the major metro areas across our state with fixed busing, but uh, a good number of us don't live in those areas and uh, we might have people who would like a ride to the, the polling places as well. And I, I just find that to be something, um, I believe the, the jargon is one Minnesota, and I, I believe that that is more of a metro Minnesota. And Chair, perhaps maybe you and I could talk about that offline to fix this provision or, you know, delete it. Uh, either way, thank you. All right. Moving on to uh, public testimony. First on my list, I have uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison. <coughs> Uh, yes, and uh, for all members and, and um, everyone that's here today, all these bills have been heard in uh, given proper time. So uh, uh, a rehash, and if we can keep our comments succinct, that would be very, very much appreciated. Uh, Attorney General Ellison, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Um, I will keep my comments very brief. I want to thank you uh, for uh, hearing from us today, and thank you for the hard work that you're doing. Uh, all of us uh, heard uh, uh, in the Attorney General's office, uh, we hear from people every single day who tell us what they need of us. They tell us that they need us to help them with uh, consumer complaints. They tell us that they, they need help in Greater Minnesota. They tell us what their needs are. They tell us that they need us to be there for state agencies for legal advice. And so our budget request is based on the uh, requests that have been made of us. Uh, we've uh, put it together carefully, and even after the forecast uh, news came out, we adjusted it and still uh, are quite grateful that um, uh, they, the governor's office uh, has put in the amount that uh, we believe we need based on uh, the work that we have in front of us. And so we simply ask you to support the governor's recommendation. Um, I would also just like to note that uh, your, your budget uh, also reflects the county attorneys in Greater Minnesota who, and what they've shared with us. And I have a uh, letter from them indicating uh, their, uh, their desire for us to be more available and, in, uh, more in, 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 and to be able to meet the needs that they have. So uh, I, that is my presentation today. Uh, we've made it uh, before. I uh, appreciate that. Appreciate the hard work you have in front of you. Uh, but just uh, want to just note that our budget is a budget based on uh, the feedback we've received uh, from the people who we represent and work with every day and hope that you can support us uh, at the recommended level. 
So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Attorney General. I have one. Looks like I have a couple quick, if we can keep our questions brief and our answers even briefer, that would be much appreciated. Uh, Representative Long. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a comment instead of a question. I just um, think the Attorney General has done a great job of laying out the need for this funding. Um, I know that with the uh, change fiscal picture that uh, the governor had to make cuts uh, across the board, um, I know that those are tough for all agencies, and I know that uh, your office was not uh, immune to having to make some changes to the uh, numbers that were in the governor's original budget. So um, just wanted to say that I, I think this goes a long way to meeting the, some of the needs that you've identified, it, even if it doesn't meet all the need, and hopefully we can keep working to uh, try to um, fulfill some of these important obligations of your office. Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Long, uh, we're grateful for the rec recommendation as it exists coming from this committee. If we can hang on here, I believe we can do the work that people are asking us to do. So thank you for your observation. All right, uh, Representative Albright, quick question for the Attorney General. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Attorney General. Uh, in this committee a couple of weeks ago, uh, the chair of the committee and I had a conversation about two other uh, um, funding appropriations in House File 4 and House File 6. And I asked him if uh, when you were going to be in attendance to talk about those, so here you are. Uh, so I'm wondering if uh, you would be able to, uh, uh, to expand on uh, the need for additional funding in House File 4, which is about the price gouging, uh, and also in House File 6 about wage theft. I'm wondering what uh, those two appropriations are for and how you're going to implement them. Mr. Chairman and uh, Representative Albright, thanks for the question. Uh, just so that members know, I did not come, I was not notified that I would need to discuss these items today. Uh, but I will tell you, uh, and I wish I had more time to prepare because I'd love to give you a detailed response. But I can assure you, the committee and you, Representative Albright, that uh, if we're going to do the work that people are telling us needs to be done, which is to protect wages, that that might mean that we may need additional staff to do that. So we, that's, that's what that particular um, um, item reflects. Uh, and on the issue of price gouging, uh, as you know, in our country today, you know, we've seen insulin go up over 1,200% uh, in the last 20 years. Now, not to mention EpiPen, Daraprim. We're in litigation right now trying to address insulin and other drugs, and it, but it, it does cost money to uh, do the representation that is needed. And so that's what those items reflect. And Representative Albright, I will add that on thurs this Thursday, uh, the Attorney General's office will have uh, someone here to, to speak on behalf of House Files 4 and 6. So we will have uh, an opportunity later this week uh, to hear from the AG's office uh, on those two specific issues. And Mr. Chair? Yes, Representative uh, Nelson. I'm sorry, Chair Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And as the Legislative Auditor Office states when he's asked about when other duties are dumped onto his office, maybe dumped is a little tough, a tough word, but given to his office, that uh, he's willing to do whatever we, do, we direct him to do. Sometimes if the funding's not there, the other things may not get done that need to get done. He's got to prioritize what he needs to get done, and I'm sure the Attorney General is quite capable in his office of being able to adjust and do the things that needs to get done in his office. Okay. Agreed. Attorney General, Ellen, I agree. thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, members, and, and enjoy your deliberations. Look forward <laughs> to seeing you on Thursday. Okay. Next, I have State Auditor uh, Julie Blaha. Welcome. And if you would, uh, I'm seeing people move around, but I'm not seeing the state auditor. You know, so we're going we're gonna to move on. Uh, next, I have uh, Secretary of State Steve Simon. Oops. Anybody from the Secretary of State's office? Okay, they'll be here. We'll come back to them. Moving on. Boy, we're, we're <coughs> up some time here, folks. Uh, next on my list, I have... Uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Cynthia Byerly. Ah, there he is. You're up. You're up. <laughs> Look at that. We were waiting on bated breath for your arrival. Uh, Secretary of State Steve Simon, if you could please introduce yourself and provide your testimony. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Steve Simon, Minnesota Secretary of State. I'm sure I just walked in, so I'm sure you have a lot of people testifying. I'll try to keep it short. Um, thank you. Uh, so, as you can see, uh, we have requested an increase to the office's base budget. Uh, we need that just to continue to provide current levels of service as a whole. And we really need an operating in increase just to keep the lights on and keep our employees employed. 
uh, in some of the statutorily required areas of the office. As you know, the operating costs continue to grow. Uh, our general fund appropriation has remained flat. If you look over 20 or 25 years, someone in our office coined the term aggressively flat mm -hmm. to describe our budget, and that's what it has been. If you account for inflation since 2003, the office would have an appropriation of nearly $9 million. <coughs> Another way to put that is that we are, uh, if you include inflation right now, we are 25% lower our budget is 25% smaller now than it was in 2003, right now. And we're not asking for you to bridge that gap. That would be an impossibly large ask. We're not asking for $9 million. We're not asking for 25%. We're asking for a moderate increase. And thank you for having that in the bill. Um, we are doing significantly more work since that time with less staff. The office is now down to about 92 FTEs from a 2004 high of 112 FTEs. Uh, and as recently as 2011, there were 111 staff, if you include consultants as well. Now we're down to about 92. Uh, but that's not sustainable, uh, given the statutory and other responsibilities that we have. So um, I'll give you an example. If we didn't get the operating increase, we would have to cut hours and services for business owners who are registering or renewing their businesses. Um, and, and the reason that matters isn't just because it's inconvenient to business owners and to businesses, it matters because, as you may know, and I never hesitate to repeat, we are that rare um, part of state government that makes money for the state. We are a net contributor of $22 million to the general fund above and beyond what we cost. So if you take every person, every paper clip, everything, we make $22 million more than we cost. And part of that is the business um, fees that we generate as well. So the more you sort of gum up the works for that, the less likely it is that the general fund is going to recoup those costs and actually make money. Um, so as I mentioned, there are fewer staff right now available to assist counties, cities, and townships conducting their elections, fewer than there once were. There would be even fewer if we didn't get the operating increase, so we really appreciate that. Uh, and then, of course, there's a Safe at Home program as well, which many of you are familiar with. Life-saving work, life-saving program. Uh, interest in it and participation in it has, I think it's fair to say, skyrocketed in the last few years. And other costs have increased, even postage. Uh, as some of you know, we handle the mail for everyone who's in the program. And there have been large postage increases. So we haven't had any sort of operating budget increase um, for six years in the Office of Secretary of State. Uh, so that's an important uh, uh, aspect as well. Uh, just to put a finer point on that, um, the program uh, in 2009 had 287 participants. When I came into office, there were about 1,600 participants. And last year, there were 27, 2,758 participants. That's an 860% increase since 2009. So to accommodate that growth, um, we need to move to a bigger, more secure space, upgrade security systems, and keep up with some of the postal increases as well. Um, just a word about something that else that's in the bill that we're very grateful for, and that's uh, the deficiency component. I testified about this a few weeks ago. Uh, the state of Minnesota was on the losing end of a U.S. Supreme Court case. You know, that's the state of Minnesota. We were the named defendant in the caption of the case, but it had to do with uh, an election law that was on the books for over 100 years. So it had nothing to do with our office in that sense. And, um, and so you included that in the bill. We, we, we really appreciate that. And then the other thing I wanted to mention just finally is thank you for putting in the match money for the Help America Vote Act money. That's very, very important. As many of you know, that issue right now is languishing. It is stuck in a conference committee. The House has made multiple offers. The Senate has not responded to the latest offer for now, I think, three weeks. They won't return phone calls. So something's you know, obviously being slow walked for a lot of reasons over there, which is unfortunate given the fact that at the beginning part of the session, both leaders, Speaker Hortman and Majority Leader Gazelka, explicitly pointed to this Help America Vote Act election security money as something that could and should be done early. It was a win-win. It was low-hanging fruit. It would be a demonstration of bipartisan success. And here we are. I think it's fair to say, I used to say the middle. We're not in the middle anymore. We're towards the end of the session, and it isn't done. And, and by the looks of the conference committee, it isn't even close to done. Um, and so uh, I really appreciate the fact that uh, this matching money is in there. We've gotten the match down. It once was $330,000, but because of efforts that our office undertook, we saved the state some money. Now the match amount is only about $167,000. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. I appreciate the investment. It's necessary. And hopefully we can continue providing the services that Minnesotans like and demand and expect and continue to actually make money for the state as well. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Secretary Mr. Simon. <clears throat> appreciate your time. Uh, next on my list, I have uh, Cynthia Bowerly, Commissioner of Minnesota Department of Revenue. Okay. Hello. <coughs> Welcome. 
you could please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair Carlson, uh, Chair Nelson. Thank you. My name is Cynthia Bowerly. I'm the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Revenue. We appreciate the time this afternoon to talk about House File 1935 as amended and uh, which supports much of the governor's recommendations for the department funding needs. As this committee heard during our overview, the department serves every individual and business entity goes obligations under Minnesota tax law. And uh, the most well-known tax, of course, is individual income tax, and we have a week left to go in filing season, so we are very busy at the Department of Revenue. 2.9 million Minnesotans rely on the department to file their taxes each year, and over 1.8 million Minnesotans have already done so. And we have issued over 1.2 million refunds to Minnesotans already this year. In addition, we serve all 87 counties, 800,000 assessors, and over 400,000 businesses across Minnesota. We provide all of these customers with the resources, forms, instructions, and information about tax credits and benefits on our website. We also help fund and promote over 210 volunteer income tax sites in Minnesota. They have been busy all spring ensuring that Minnesotans can help get, get help they need to have their taxes prepared. And for 20... The tax year 2017, state VITA sites returned about $128 million in refunds to Minnesotans across the state. Business classes are offered by the department in locations across Minnesota and by webinar for the convenience of business owners. Last year, we all held over 60 classes and webinars at locations across the state. We provide guidance to businesses in the form of revenue notices, fact sheets, and industry guides. The governor's budget recommendation was based on maintaining these existing services across Minnesota for all Minnesotans and the technology systems that we need to efficiently process and protect private taxpayer data. The funding levels requested in the governor's budget were intended to support these current services and staffing levels. And we appreciate the funding level that we have in the bill before you, and we look forward to working with the committee as it moves forward to fully fund the governor's recommendations for the department services. We do have some concerns about the uh, reduction, albeit small. It does affect the services that we provide to Minnesotans. We have concerns about the restrictions on professional and technical contracts included in the bill. In particular, we would, are concerned that the restrictions will have a potential impact on the technology and other contracts that support the tax system itself. Many of these contracts support maintenance of systems that process and protect individual and business tax information. Lastly, we support the governor's recommendation to allow agencies to carry forward operating balances between fiscal years. This provision will allow agencies to plan thoughtfully and provide the spending uh, agility that we need to plan, particularly for long-term strategic investments, including information technology. We are grateful for the support for the governor's recommendations and for all of the work that the department does in this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we look forward to working with the committee. We are eager to serve Minnesota taxpayers as efficiently, as effective as we can, and we need your help to secure the appropriate level of financial resources as this bill provides. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on 1935, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. I do have a question, someone on the list here. Uh, Representative Albright. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Barley. Um, I note in the spreadsheet uh, that we went through that the governor's budget is $500,000 more than what the chair has put into his budget. And I'm just curious what impact that will have on your agent, your department, if it is not fulfilled at the level that the governor has requested. Commissioner Bowerly. Uh, Chair Carlson and and uh, Vice, and uh, Mr. Sorry, Representative Albright. Uh, so the governor's budget was to maintain existing services. So a reduction of five hundred thousand dollars will require us to find ways to um, reduce services that we're performing right now to Minnesotans. Uh, we would uh, look to find any cost efficiencies, as we do every single year uh, with any budget that we have. Um, but we are requesting full funding of the governor's recommendations. Representative Albright. So can you give me a uh, more concrete example in terms of what that might look like? Are you looking at laying off staff, re reducing services? What's the prioritization in terms of how you would reduce uh, funding by $500,000? Uh, Commissioner Bowley. 
uh, Chair Carlson and Representative Albright. So we would uh, look to manage this reduction probably through attrition, but it really is staffing. So what it would mean is that uh, we would not be able to fully fill positions as they become vacant through attrition uh, with uh, the staff that we need. And uh, depending on where that attrition happened, we would continue to prioritize everywhere we can the services that we provide to Minnesotans. Mm -hmm. But the reality is without the staffing that we have uh, requested through the governor's recommendation, there will be impacts uh, to taxpayers. Mr. Chair, just a follow up on yes. that. Then. Uh, Mr. Ms. Bowerly, with $500,000 at stake, can you give me an approximation in terms of how many FTEs that might consider? Uh, Commissioner. Uh, Chair Carlson and uh, Mr. Albright, um, the uh, we would expect that, depending again on the type of staffing, that could uh, be anywhere from, I would expect from five to ten uh, uh, individuals, individual staff positions. Mr. Chair? Yes, Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Barley, so at yeah, five yeah. to ten, so these would be positions that would range in uh, salary with benefits from anywhere from on the low end, 50000 up to 100000 um, So are those mid-range, are those entry level, uh, senior level? What, how do you prioritize who has to be uh, let go? Commissioner Bauer. Chair Carlson and uh, Mr. Albright, as I said, we would manage this through uh, we would manage this through attrition, so it would depend a lot on what positions became open. I will tell you that one of the ways we can manage that um, is with our seasonal staff. Uh, seasonal staff are brought back during tax time to ensure uh, that we can process uh, refunds and payments uh, timely. And so we, um, that's probably where we would start is by managing there. Other uh, staff may leave the department for new opportunities or through retirements. Uh, and uh, we would also, of course, be looking at those areas as well. Representative Albright. No more. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. This morning. Next, I have uh, Mr. Poyer, uh, Acting Commissioner for uh, Minnesota Information and Technology. Going once. The auditor has arrived. Ah, yes. State Auditor Julie Baja, please uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Well, good afternoon. Uh, yes, my name is Julie Baja, and I'm your state auditor. Uh, wanted to say thank you. It was a fun Sunday to be able to dig through uh, your proposal here. And uh, uh, as I think the other constitutional officers uh, said, thank you so much for including uh, the needs that our office has. Uh, as you know, since the last time we spoke, we have uh, adjusted our uh, budget request down. Um, and we're focusing on our top priorities of a township specialist, which will help us serve our townships in the way they deserve to be served. Uh, revealing an executive assistant so we can continue with the work of outreach and staying connected with those we serve. Uh, refilling a deputy to ensure we're ready for this kind of new structure that we're in. Uh, and the operating adjustment that would, where we would fill out of positions only if we had additional fees uh, generated to support them. Uh, and so again, I, I appreciate uh, the inclusion in there. I believe this is the kind of thing that keeps us uh, ready, uh, prepared, and connected in the way that Minnesotans deserve. Thank you, Madam Auditor. That was fantastic. <laughs> You're in a hurry. I'm All your right. person. Appreciate <laughs> Thank it. you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, next, I have uh, Commissioner of Administration, uh, Ms. Alice Roberts Davis. And then uh, we'll have Mr. Poyer next. Welcome. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. I am Alice Roberts Davis. I'm the Commissioner for the Department of Administration. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Uh, the department greatly appreciates that you fully funded Governor Walz's budget recommendations. These investments will maintain sound fiscal management by making modest, prudent investments in continuing current operations, improving our service delivery, and also ensuring a complete count census. Specifically, with in lieu of rent, this will help fund uh, proper maintenance recommended by the Capital Preservation Commission to properly care for the restored Capitol building. Following the Commission's Capital Maintenance Handbook will prevent the building from falling back into disrepair, so we appreciate that. In addition, the Procurement Technical Assistance Center funding helps admin better serve Minnesota's businesses and assist them with the opportunity to procure 
um, with the state, federal and local governments. This funding for PTAC will also expand its geographic reach by adding three counselors in greater Minnesota and one in metro area. Uh, this parentally recognized program was, has already helped Minnesota businesses earn more than $300 million in local, state, and federal contracts since they joined the state in 2017. Admin's operating budget adjustment will allow us to fund our retirement obligations while we continue to provide the exceptional services that our agency partners need and that Minnesotans expect. And then finally, funding census outreach will enable us to contact hard to reach households and ensure that every Minnesotan is counted. A complete count is essential for adequate congressional representation and Minnesota's fair share of federal dollars. There are, however, several provisions in the bill that we found problematic and that we hope that we can work with the committee on continuing to, to look at for revisiting. Um, there are many new grants throughout the bill that the Office of Grants Management will be required to administer. However, there's not funding for that administrative work. We would request that all new grants have some administrative funding. Specifically, we would request $10,000 to administer the local government website accessibility grants and the staff, the advisory council. We also understand the budget pressures that you're under, but we've seen the negative impact that cuts to professional and technical contracts have created in the past. We would ask that you reconsider these cuts as well. We thank you for inclusion in the governor's budget recommendations, and we look forward to working with you through the conference committee process. Thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> Seeing no questions. Next, we have uh, <coughs> Mr. Poyer, uh, Acting Commissioner for Minnesota Information Technology. Welcome. <coughs> Please uh, introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. For the record, I'm Bill Poirier. I'm the Acting uh, Commissioner for the Minnesota IT Services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the Delete All Amendment to HF 1935. First, we greatly appreciate the author's funding of the governor's recommendations in the area of cybersecurity. If ultimately enacted into law, these crucial investments in cyber tools, services, and staff would fill critical gaps in the state's cyber defenses. This appropriation would also fund and accelerate ongoing efforts to reduce the state's overall cyber attack surface by reducing the number of data centers from the current number of 16 down to five in the upcoming biennium. We also greatly appreciate the author's full funding of the governor's recommendations in the areas of IT project and program management. With over 350 projects ongoing in the executive branch at any time, it's critical that Minute strengthen its oversight of agency-based software development as recommended by the legislative auditor. There are currently three staff in Minute's Enterprise Project Management Office that perform this oversight work. Without additional staffing, they are not positioned to effectively enforce compliance with IT project best practices such as risk assessment and mitigation activities. This investment funds eight new FTEs to oversee this portfolio uh, or projects in addition to private sector consulting services to analyze gaps in our project management oversight processes, develop and implement an improvement plan, and conduct periodic reviews of program progress. Lastly, as it relates to the legislature's compliance with state accessibility standards, we at Minute are happy to assist in these compliance efforts using current resources, tools, and training already developed by the department. We do want to be clear up front, though, that as a fee-for-service organization, our capacity to assist in the development of applications at no charge would be quite limited. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify and for the recognition of these fundamental resource needs at Minute Services. I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Poirier, uh, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Ms. Bowerly. In the, uh, the DE, uh, you are not funded fully. You've got a, a deficit of about $497,000. What would that go towards if you were fully funded? Uh, Commissioner. Um, it would go towards the more tools and services and capabilities on the cyber side. Representative Albright. Right. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you for your time and your testimony. Next, I have uh, Red Wing City Council member, uh, Ms. Becky Norton. Welcome. If you could please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Uh, 
Hello, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the House Government Finance Committee. Thank you. Um, I am Becky Norton, and I am a high school teacher, 8th through 12th grade uh, science in Red Wing, Minnesota, and I am Red Wing City Council member for Ward 3. And I wanted to come and talk to you a little bit about Red Wing's um, case for ranked choice voting, um, which is, I know, a part of this omnibus bill. Um, Red Wing brought up this conversation a few, a few years ago, um, but the conversation really stalled out on um, our limits be between ballots and our equipment. Um, the residents really wanted ranked choice voting, uh, but we couldn't really progress it very far. So we're in support of this, um, of this portion of the bill. <clears throat> this year we had a really unique election. We had three vacancies in city council, which meant that we ran three special elections, three, two primary elections, there could have been three, and then three general elections. So we had a very busy ballot in both August and again in November. Ranked choice voting would have simplified a lot of that, and it may, would have made sure that the candidates that were elected were elected by a plurality of the residents, which I think is an important choice in choosing who is representing you, especially at the city council level. So ranked choice voting would allow us to do this. This bill um, doesn't mandate that every community create ranked choice voting, but it does clear some of those roadblocks to ranked choice voting. Um, such as uh, ballots, streamlining the ballots, uh, and making sure that equipment can handle it. Um, the biggest thing that I, I have heard when talking to residents about voting or why they choose not to vote is that they don't want their vote, they want their vote to matter. And some people choose not to vote because they say, well, my vote doesn't count. And the one thing that I love about ranked choice voting is that it makes sure that every vo vote counts all the way through that process um, until there's a plurality or a majority. Um, many residents of Red Wing, including members of the Charter Commission, were interested, as I've stated several years ago. Um, so this bill doesn't require nor mandate the city implement ranked choice voting. It creates standards around this voting method instead of leaving it to be implemented individually by the cities. It makes sense to include st statutory cities and other units of government creating state standards for the ranked choice voting. Um, so again, as I've said, I think it clears away a lot of those hurdles or obstacles. And as also, as I've mentioned, um, we voted on this at city council that all seven of the city council members supported this bill. I'm an advocate for ranked choice voting, clearly. And time will soon show, I believe, that that's a really great way for our democracy to move towards. Uh, um, overwhelmingly, communities who have used ranked choice voting have thought that it was a simpler method and support its use uh, continuing in the future. So our residents want to have a conversation about ranked choice voting to, to determine if it's a right fit for each of them in each of these communities. Please support this bill so that obstacles may re be removed and that conversations with residents may can continue at the local level. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Thank you. Uh, See no questions. Next, I have Ms. C. Her, Executive Director of the Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans. Welcome. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair and members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment on House File 1935 as amended. For the record, my name is Sia Her, and I am the Executive Director at the Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans. Uh, first, Mr. Chair and members, on behalf of our council, thank you um, to all of you for supporting the governor's recommendation to ensure that our council is not only able to maintain our current level of service uh, delivery, but that we're also able to add a communications staff. A dedicated communications position at the council would contribute to our capacity to more effectively, strategically, and efficiently engage with our very diverse community statewide using a variety of mechanisms, including social and traditional uh, media. We appreciate your support very much and hope that this base amount will serve as the constant starting point for your ongoing deliberations. 
Um, secondly, I want to thank the members of this committee with whom I have met. I, I appreciated the opportunity to have more nuanced conversations with all of you about the infrastructure our council needs. And in some of those meetings, I had the opportunity to answer some very tough questions about who um, Asian Pacific Minnesotans are. Um, it is in that particular part of the conversations that I find the most hope for our state. So um, with your ongoing support, uh, our council continues to deliver on our statutory purpose of advising you and the governor on behalf of Minnesota's fastest growing minority community um, as you seek to design better policy solutions to the challenges facing all Minnesotans. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon and I'm more than happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Hurd. Uh, seeing no questions, we'll move on to our next testifier. I have um, Ms. Mary Hartnett, Commissioner of Death, uh, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. <coughs> Welcome. Okay. Would do you need a few minutes? Or okay. Good afternoon, Chairman uh, Carlson and members. My name is Ann Sittner Anderson with uh, a communications coordinator at the Commission for Deaf, Deaf Blind, and Hard of Hearing Minnesotans. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today. We want to thank you for including the website accessibility IT work group for the legislature. This groundbreaking legislation that will make online legislation, uh, legislative services and information accessible and make the capital more inclusive and welcoming. It will provide people with disabilities the opportunity to become more engaged as citizens, to become legislators, interns, staff, and participate on a level playing field. Next, we hope that by the time that conference committee has finished its work, that we have made a stronger case and that the study on the retention of state employees with disabilities and policy provisions that strengthen affirmative action laws are included in the final bill. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time and your testimony today. Thank you. Seeing no questions. Next, I have uh, Ms. Michelle Chang, Policy and Equity Coordinator for Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. Welcome. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Michelle Chang. I am the Policy and Equity Coordinator at the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. MCN is part of the Census Mobilization Partnership. Our role is tapping into our network of 2,000 plus member organizations statewide and beyond. Civic engagement is therefore, and therefore, the census is deeply important to nonprofits. We urge you to fund the census at $2.5 million. The census is about equity and inclusion. It is a nonpartisan element in our democracy and it impacts all of us every day and it is how communities are seen and heard. Nonprofits have a critical role to promote community participation and build power. We are all stronger when communities are using their voice to help shape and change the systems that impact them every day, especially communities that have been historically disenfranchised. We need full funding at 2.5 million to complete this important task. MCN has 10, point year, 10 plus years of experience doing census and civic engagement work. Our members reach all, all of communities and inc um, include community-based organizations that are trusted, which is especially important for historically undercounted communities. For the 2020 census, our role is to work with organizations that are in and of historically undercounted communities, as well as the general public. It takes all of us to get out the count. That includes public and private partnership. We must work together to ensure equity and inclusion in our democracy because we are all stronger when our democracy is strong. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no questions. Next, I have uh, Ms. Jennifer uh, uh, Bertram, Kids Count Coordinator. 
Children's Defense Fund, Minnesota. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Bertram. I'm the Kids Count Coordinator at Children's Defense Fund, Minnesota, and I'm here to ask for full funding for census outreach. The past 12 months, I've participated in activities convened by the Minnesota Census Mobilization Partnership and the co-creation table in establishing a plan for outreach activities for Census 2020. Our work on this effort stems from a collective understanding of the importance of a complete count in Minnesota to ensure that our state's voice be heard in Washington by retaining our eighth congressional seat and that the needs of our communities are met by adequate allocation of federal dollars. <coughs> 15 organizations are represented in our co-creation table, and we are currently working on an extensive outreach and engagement plan, including on-the-ground efforts with a train-the-trainer curriculum and engagement effort to reach groups that have historically been identified as undercounted, including children under age five, people living in multifamily housing units, renters, people living below poverty level, and people of color and immigrant population. The Minnesota Council on Foundations has secured significant pooled resources from foundations across the state that recognize the value of this effort in ensuring a complete count for Minnesota that will be distributed to three hubs, the co-creation table that I'm a member of, the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, and a partnership of the 11 tribes in Minnesota. Additionally, complete count committees are being formed to conduct outreach activities in communities throughout the state. In 2010, over 300 of these committees were established, and we expect at least that number this round. This effort is complex and requires a state investment beyond the scope of foundation support to ensure that the outreach activities are sufficient to reach the undercounted communities and support the intent of the census to ensure that everyone is counted. State funds would be available to the state demographer's office, along with the three hubs, the complete count committees, and others who would like to support the Minnesota census count and ensure that the data used for this census accurately represents everyone who lives in our state. Mr. Chair, thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of allocating $2.5 million for census outreach activities. Thank you, Ms. Bertram. I appreciate your testimony. Uh, seeing no questions, next I have Mr. Uh, Sean Broom from Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce. Anybody from the chamber here today? Okay, we'll keep going. Next I have um, Mr. Bob Tracy, uh, Director of Public Policy and Communication, Minnesota Council on Foundations. Welcome. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Bob Tracy. Uh, for the record, Director of Public Policy and Communication for Minnesota Council on Foundations. And I'm here representing both our membership, but also the Minnesota Census Mobilization Partnership. Mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity to speak with many of you and also present to this committee, so I'm not going to repeat any of those mm -hmm. points, except to thank you for uh, recognizing the importance of investing uh, in the census now. Um, we don't get an opportunity for a do-over, so it reflects your uh, understanding of the importance. What I'm going to do today, though, is to try to give you some guidance about the impact of how to manage the discrepancy between the $2.5 million that was requested and the $1.6 million that's recommended. I know for many of you, as I uh, discuss the census with you, you ask if that $2.5 million was a scalable number. Yes, it is. But 35% is a very, very, very steep drop. Let me give you a sense of what we end up doing. The initiative has uh, eight activities. With the 35% cut, one of three things could happen. First of all, the amount of that cut is pretty much equal to all of the funds that are being proposed for distribution to communities and local governments through many grants. I would not recommend doing away with that part of the initiative. The second option, though, would be to do away with those parts of the initiative that are designed to reach historically undercounted <laughs> communities. They come to approximately the same amount of what's being proposed in this cut, as well as making some other scaling back of many grants and some of the other initiatives. But what we would lose is the effort to do particular outreach to help people get connected with census jobs, and the targeted community engagement that was just described to you. The third option would be to continue uh, with the community engagement, let go of the work to try to help people uh, get census jobs, 
but to do away with the proposed apartment access initiative, which is about $330,000. There are options here for doing less, and there's a way to get to 1.6 million. We think that those would be uh, detrimental to the overall effort that we're proposing. But we also recognize that there are competing demands and cuts uh, need to be made in this request. We do see an opportunity to eliminate the Census Job Connections Initiative. That would take almost $350,000 off the table. Along with some scaling back of some of the community grants, we think we could get to $2.15 million, a 15% scaling back of the initiative. So I'm happy to work with the committee chair and others to try to find a way to keep the project whole. However, if we do go with the 1.6 million, it's very important then for the committee then to also look at uh, section 48 subdivisions two, three, four, and five. Those describe the components of the initiative. We can't do all of those things with 1.6 million. So we need guidance and the department needs guidance then on what parts of the initiative then we would remove. But I wanna go back to thanking the committee chair who's been working on the census issue. I think you did some summer camp work around that. And the committee members for recognizing the importance of the census to the state. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tracy. Uh, seeing no questions, next I have uh, Jessica Webster, uh, Minnesota Legal Aid. Welcome. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. My name is Jessica Webster. I'm a staff attorney with Legal Aid, and I'm just here to thank Representative Nelson for restoring the funding for the Healthy Eating Here at Home program. I also wanted to thank the members of this committee who over the last few weeks have uh, spoken passionately about this program in committee and also had conversations with advocates and farmers and communities about our concerns about uh, defunding this program and, and possibly putting it at risk this session. So I really appreciate the continued funding. Um, this is a, it's an excellent program. It's efficiently run. It's a win-win for communities, farmers, seniors, uh, and people who need healthy and access to healthy food. So thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, I have Leah Gardner, Hunger Solutions, Minnesota. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Leah Gardner. I'm with Hunger Solutions, Minnesota. I just wanted to briefly add my comments on behalf of all of the advocates that spoke up last week for the Market Bucks program or Healthy Eating Here at Home and to add our sincere thanks for your work and your leadership over the last week to ensure this program's continued funding in the base budget and also to identify a long-term home for the program within the Department of Agriculture. As you've heard time and time again, it's a win-win for all of our communities. It provides additional dollars for families that are struggling to make ends meet, often their only option for having fresh food. It's a win for farmers bringing new customers and much needed income uh, for many farmers that are struggling right now in these challenging times. And it's a win for Minnesota's economy. We know that for every dollar spent on SNAP, $1.79 is generated in economic activity. Um, so we just wanted to again thank you for your leadership and finding a solution for this program. And I do have a couple letters from advocates who weren't able to be here today uh, also offering their thanks. Great. Thank you, Ms. Gardner. Uh, see no questions. The last on my list, I have uh, Mr. Matt Hilgart with the Association of Minnesota Counties. Welcome, welcome back, and please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair, members, thank you very much. My name is Matt Hilgart, and I work for the Association of Minnesota Counties. AMC represents all of Minnesota's 87 counties. I'll try to be short on the pieces that I've covered in uh, prior committee hearings, but in general, we support uh, five of the elections uh, provisions included in this omnibus bill, including the uh, both provisions on the presidential primary, both that data privacy aspect of it, which we talked about the ballot choice, and then also uh, the reimbursement to local governments. We support the restoration of felon voting rights, the 400 mail balloting threshold for suburban communities, and the HAVA election cybersecurity grant funding. And we appreciate the bipartisan support on those particular provisions over the course of this year. 
We also want to thank the chair and members for the inclusion of the grant program to local governments to improve website accessibility, as well as the state demographer appropriation for the census 2020 mobilization, recognizing the full request uh, that members just spoke recently about uh, to get to that 2.5. In particular, we want to pay some attention to supporting the Minnesota based complete count communities, which is part of this grant proposal that is made up by local communities and governments that are dedicated to spreading the word about the census and uh, talking about the importance of participation as members know and probably here on other committees at the legislature counties are mandated to be the social safety net for Minnesota a lot of our funding comes through the federal government so if we don't have an accurate census count we are hit your property taxpayers are hit um, by uh, a faulty uh, census count and lastly, I'd like to take a minute to address a couple things that have been omitted in this particular version of the omnibus and that we're hoping to work with members on. Uh, first, uh, House File 132, uh, Representative Mason's user acceptance testing language. I know she's worked diligently with um, interested parties and the Minnesota Intercounty Association. This premise is that if the state is going to put out new technology, software, upgrades, et cetera, that they work with local governments to implement those. It was included in last year's omnibus bill. We're hoping that a form of this can be included by the end of the year. And then the last bill, and I'm, I'm smiling while I say this because I know members are probably exhausted from hearing this, but is the county row officer appointment bill, which seems to come up every single year uh, at the Capitol. And I know that there are several members, almost half of this committee is authors and on this bill, and I know more than half is supportive of this bill, and we're hopeful that um, we can move this issue forward. It's a proposal that's supported by the elected auditors, treasurers, recorders association themselves and the County Commissioners Association is a compromise that we feel has been vetted over the course of a decade and we are hoping to move this across the finish line now with over half of counties now having the, appoint the ability to either appoint and or combine one or more of their row officers. So we look forward to working with members on those provisions as the year moves on. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hilgard, stick around for just a second. Uh, Representative Nash, I believe, has a question for you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Hilgard, um, <coughs> To your question regarding the user acceptance testing, um, and perhaps you can phone a friend since the author is here, what was the approximate cost for the 87 counties um, for the amount of overtime that was assessed back to tax rolls um, just for the Minlars rollout? Because I, I know that in, in Carver County, it was well over, I believe, $75,000 in its first year of, of uh, life. So if you could maybe help us uh, <coughs> shine some light on that, or um, since I know your phone number, I, I'm going to make you bring it back to us, if you would, because I, I do think that this is an important provision. Mr. Is, uh, Rep Mr. Chair, Representative Nash, I don't have it on hand, but I will try to look for that. I'm sorry. And Mr. Chair. Yeah, Representative Nash. Uh, and if I could encourage uh, Chair Nelson to consider putting that bill in here. It's an important thing to not only look at software or technology in general when it's going to get rolled out, and Representative Elkins can talk to this as well, but, but when you put it in front of the users, having them essentially try to break it before you take it out of, uh, out of uh, development stage is a wise uh, thing to do. And I don't know what the fiscal note on that bill was. Uh, I can't imagine that it was a lot, but it, it seems to me that from a county and municipality perspective, that that's a pretty benign request. And, and Chair Nelson, I would really encourage you to, to look at accepting an amendment that might get offered to put that in, because once again, uh, 87 counties, I would almost guarantee all of them have had some overtime as a result of this, and it would have been perhaps caught that there were things that were not ready for uh, play and that it could have prevented a lot of those counties, namely Carver, the, the, no, the number that I know, uh, from having to encumber themselves and the taxpayers with a lot of overtime. So okay, thank no. you. Uh, Representative Elkins, uh, you had a question, yeah, comment. This, one I just, this, this bill is um, on the general register in both chambers. Um, can it move on its own? To Representative Nash? Uh, Mr. Okay. Chair, uh, Nash? there's a time-honored tradition of belt and suspenders, so it's always nice to, to have it tucked in as many places as possible. Um, and I think that that's probably something that we want to look at as well to make sure that uh, that things get think good policy like this. And this is a bipartisan thing, folks. It, it, we want good policy to be tucked in as many places as it possibly can. Okay. Well, that concludes my uh, list of testifiers. Is there any members from the audience that... Yeah. 
have come to testify today? If so, welcome. Uh, please introduce yourself and uh, proceed with your testimony. And folks, we are going to wrap up uh, by 2.30, so plan accordingly if uh, you do plan to testify. Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, Representative Nelson, members of the committee, my name is Kent Whitworth. I'm the director and CEO of the Minnesota Historical Society. I have had the good fortune as with my colleague David Kelleher to visit with a number of you and to testify before this committee a couple of times. Uh, I come today on behalf of the Minnesota Historical Society to express our deep appreciation to you for your budget recommendation. We are very grateful for your recommended operating adjustment to support our very talented staff. And just last week, in fact, I guess it was uh, a week ago Monday night, uh, we were able to testify on our digital preservation and access efforts. We were heartened by the committee's strong interest in making Minnesota's historical resources more accessible. And we are especially appreciative of your $395,000 recommendation in each year of the next bond for that important work. So I uh, just wanted to express our formal thanks to each of you and to Mr. Representative Nelson in particular. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wentworth. Uh, Chair. Yes, Ms. Uh, Chair Nelson. Earlier we had a question asked about assessed cemeteries. And maybe this is the person to ask about that, seeing as how that's part of the historical society's piece in the budget. Um, Mr. Repworth, kind of put on the spot there. Uh, well, Representative Nelson um, knows that I'm going to play the new card, I think. Um, I've, I've been on staff for about nine months. Uh, I'm, I'm looking to my colleague, David Kelleher, and see if he wants to, to address that. I'm, I'm not in a position to do that right on the fly. And if they, Mr. Chair, if they don't have the information exactly, but we can, hopefully they'll get it to us. That was the question that was asked earlier. And, sure. Um, Welcome, Mr. Kelleher. Please uh, introduce yourself and uh, enlighten us with your archaeological knowledge. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, David Kelleher, Minnesota Historical Society. I'm not an archaeologist, um, so I can just take a, a stab at uh, answering that question. Um, the provisions um, that are in the bill that we were discussing earlier um, are primarily the responsibility of the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council and the Office of the State Archaeologist. We have archaeologists on our staff and we all work together to come up with that language. I think the distinction between authenticated and assessed, assessed is a slightly broader term that, that takes in some of the methods that are used, whether it's ground penetrating radar or some of the other uh, methods that, that don't disturb uh, the ground or the human remains that are there, but, but make a, a good assessment, if you will, that uh, what we think is there is actually there. Authentication is a term that implies strong certainty, and there are a lot of times that you don't want to disturb uh, human remains um, because that's not what we do, but we want to know what's there. So that's my um, best attempt, and I, I think we can um, get the people who actually do this work for a living to um, confirm what I just said or not. Thank you, Mr. Keller. I appreciate Mr. Chair, it. If they can give you the information and get the information to Representative Albright um, going forward, because I'm sure it's going to get asked again on the floor. Sure. Will do. All right. Uh, other members from the public? Uh, please, sir, uh, if you want to uh, approach the desk and introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Michael Holt. I'm retired. I live in St. Paul. We had a mayoral election a year plus ago with 10 candidates running. And I took a look at the candidates and what they had stated and their experience. And because I had ranked choice voting, in effect, I was able to select. I decided that there were four of them I thought had a reasonable chance of being an effective mayor. And I was able to vote for all four of them. And I am grateful for that. Uh, you may know that Melvin Carter won the election. I did not pick him as my first choice but he was one of the four I voted for. And this meant that after the election, I had a sense of buy-in that I had voted for the winner. Whereas had I been able to vote for only one, I would not have voted for him. This increased my sense of satisfaction with the election. 
we live in a time where people are detached from politics, turned off by politics, and ranked choice voting is a way to help people get back in. Another one of the advantages is that it gives candidates an incentive to keep their campaigns positive because they know that they might not get enough votes on the first choice to get elected, but if they don't antagonize other candidates' supporters, they might well get second and third choice votes from those people and still win the election. It has a lot of positive benefits. I'm very glad we have it in St. Paul, and I think it would be good for the state as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Appreciate your testimony. Others from the audience? Got some time, folks. Come on down. Okay, come on down. Welcome. Chair Nelson's looking at me like, well, let's not have everybody come down. <laughs> well, this is, I was just thinking, I, we must have what, wrote, written such a wonderful bill that there aren't, aren't a lot of opposition to it. Well, I got I to <laughs> mouth this being chair for as long as I can. So if I just want to come testify. Welcome, sir. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testi uh, testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Bill Strasinski, and I'm here representing the Libby Law Office and, and the Association of Friends of Minnesota Public Television. <laughs> I want to thank this committee for in its fine work from our perspective for the grant funding that's in the Department of Administration for public television. These grants are absolutely essential for us to do our job. We have bricks and mortar, but we need to do programming. And it's extremely important that those grants which go towards uh, our operations are funded and we appreciate uh, for funding us at the governor's base request. The programs we continue to produce will be on the air uh, benefit the public and Mr. Rogers neighborhood the trolleys will be running on time I want you to know that so thank you very much for that the second thing I wanted to mention is I do appreciate the chair and this committee's recognition for the importance of a project we brought to you on a cold snowy day uh, a month or so ago called beyond opioids that pro program is you're providing some general fund money for public television as well as the amper stations to do a significant outreach community education uh, and uh, develop programs, including lesson guides and plans for schools and what have you. An enormous program, an enormous undertaking we will do this next coming uh, year. Um, I, th I think this perhaps is the one spot, certainly in the legislature, where we really get into the meat and substance of that particular issue of, of, uh, of how, to, how, do you, how do you address it from the public's perspective. The needs are enormous, you all know that, but we will do it in, a, in quite a way for public television and the Amper's radio station. So we appreciate the specific support and recognition of that. And I, I think also many of you on this committee are, are authors of that particular bill. Mr. Chairman, we do appreciate your efforts with that special recognition. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Trzynski. Appreciate your testimony. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, question or testimony? Oh, question. If you want to approach the microphone, please. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Hi there, my name is Mark Hughes and I want to thank you for this bill because when I'm not here, I'm usually an executive producer and anchor of a TV show that the Minnesota Channel and TPT usually support. And so I want to thank you for the inclusion of TPT's uh, needs in this bill. And I hope uh, that it continues because the technology is always changing. And we just went, uh, not too long ago, went under a new renovation project of the studios and so our our production equipment is changing but also the needs of the community because we have different ethnic groups that are using those services now so I appreciate your support of the bill I'm a Minnesota, uh, TPT Minnesota Studio Society member and all I want to say is thank you well thank you for your testimony it's very much appreciated You're welcome. oh okay uh, welcome Yes, Ms. Mary Hartnett. Welcome back to the committee. 
Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, I just want to, to say what an incredible bill this is for people with disabilities and accessibility. Um, while I was sitting here, we had advocated for the IT accessibility standards and work group for the state that um, thank you so much for your leadership in taking on this bill, Representative Nelson, Chair Nelson, for, for doing that OB. As um, my colleague said, what a, what a groundbreaking piece of legislation that is, but also that there's uh, funding for accessibility for the historical society to make their documents <laughs> accessible that there's funding for counties and municipalities. This is wonderful. I mean, really, 10 years ago was the first time we passed the accessibility bill, uh, uh, law, and now it's catching up um, with the rest of the state. And I just want to thank you for your leadership and thank all of you for including this in the bill. Thank you, Ms. Hartnett. Appreciate your testimony. Anybody else? OK. Well, with that, um, closing comments, Chair Nelson, well, before you, we Mr. lay over your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. and. Uh, um, I'm, the deadline for amendments is tomorrow at 10 a.m., mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'll be interested to see what the amendments are coming forward, and uh, members will have a long discussion with the amendments tomorrow. I know there's going to be a break. We have to be in there's a session at 9 a.m., so we'll start and then come back and then uh, work on the bill, hopefully get the bill out tomorrow at the latest as get it out, come back Wednesday morning at our normal, our more normal time and get it passed out at that point. So. Members, um, thanks for the questions and uh, thank you for the okay. bill. So with that, I'm going to lay over House File 1935 and the DE1 amendment. Uh, we will return tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, April 9th uh, at 8 o'clock. Nope. 8 o'clock. I'm seeing heads nodding yes. 8 o'clock a.m., bright and early. Um, so we'll lay it over until tomorrow. And then with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.